Hey everybody, today is March 28th, 2017. This is Human Factors Cast, episode 35. This is a pretty slow week in real news. We're going to be breaking down some of that fake news, cybersecurity, and uh, the evil mastermind himself, Elon Musk, is doing a human brain interface company. Is that your ripple vibrating, or are you just happy to see us? Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What is going on, everybody? Happy Tuesday. Hey, there he is. Happy Tuesday to you, Blake. And also, welcoming Mia Haramijo on the show for her very first time, and actually our very first female on the show, finally. Uh, <laughs> Mia, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, we are happy to have you here on Human Factors Cast. Uh, Blake, you're you're here this do you're here this week. Yes, the power is on and we are here for the full show this time. That's amazing. That's amazing. We had a special thanks, special shout out to uh, my buddy Nick Porter who kind of filled in last week with the analysis piece of the last couple uh last couple stories. Uh, he really helped us out. But uh you're yeah, here this time. the powerful Nick Porter. I really appreciate him <laughs> hopping on. I know, yeah. I was like last minute too. I was like, who am I going to get to do this? All right. So anyway, so we got Blake here. Power isn't out this week we're good uh mia this is your first time on the show so welcome uh, thank you thank so so mia why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself just kind of like a brief background um i went to an aeronautical school and in daytona beach and i got a major in human factors and systems engineering which is what i actually practiced for five years before moving to sunny southern california yeah and uh what kind of what kind of research interests or research areas, I guess, are you are you currently invested in? Um, I really like human factors that has to deal with interfaces and um, knowledge management, information presentation, uh, lowering workload for users, that type of thing. Excellent. Well, to have your perspective on the show will surely be welcomed this week, um, especially because we got we got a pretty slow week uh, in news stories. But that's okay because we're going to break down each story uh, for you today. But before we do that. Uh, this is something that we never do here on Human Factors Cast, but ACT Today, uh, they reached out to us and said, hey, Human Factors Cast, can you promote our fundraiser on the show? And I, of course, was like, what's ACT Today? And so I looked it up, and, and they I talked to them a little bit, and they, they it's basically the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, uh, and they would like you to help reach their $2,000 fundraising goal. It's It's a local chapter, so it's fairly obtainable with the help of our human factors cast listeners and again we don't really like to ask our listeners to do things but this is so important that you guys do this so they're they're doing a 5k 10k run walk um act today is for military families and it's a campaign fund uh that's a na national nonprofit organization whose mission is to raise awareness and provide treatment and services and support to families to help their children with autism achieve their full potential so you can go to www.acttodayformilitaryfamilies.kintera, K-I-N-T-E-R-A dot org, and then donate under the team card. Uh, and that closes on April 15th. So you guys will be directly supporting the ease of life for military families affected by them. Thanks to ACT for reaching out to us. Counting on Human Factors Cast to, to break it down. All right, guys. So this is the part of the show all about human factors news. Now, this could be anything from artificial intelligence to virtual reality. I guess we're covering fake news now, too. Automation, psychology, design, you name it. Whatever. Whatever it is, as long as it has to do with the field of human factors. Blake, you're reading the stories today. What's up first, buddy? All right. So this is a slow news week, like Nick said. But this one's a kind of a heavy hitter, especially for the three of us, since we all have a science background. So... Nonetheless, if someone applied to a top position at a company, you'd hope a hiring manager would at least Google the applicant to ensure they're qualified, right? A group of researchers sent, a phony, re sent phony resumes to 360 scientific journals for an applicant whose Polish name transfer translated to Dr. Fraud. 
and 48 journals happily appointed the fake doctor to their editorial board. This sting operation was the first systematic analysis on editorial roles in science publishing, adding concrete evidence to a, pef- to a problem past stings have shed light on. These types of issues can result in important science not being published in real journals or worse, bad, unvetted science being published, scientists bolstering their resumes with crap and eroding public trust in science as an institution. Now, Nick, I know you've got some powerful thoughts on this. What is your take? It pisses me off, man. It pisses me off. Okay, so okay, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was always told, I was always taught you know, research with integrity. Like that is uh, before anything, research with integrity. Don't just go for P values or whatever. Go for what's going to benefit mankind, first off. And second off, go for meaningful things, right? Even if you don't find out what you're set out to accomplish, think far, like the crime here is really scientists not thinking out their sort of, uh, their research far enough. Um, and then, and then, that is perpetuating this whole phony journal. It, uh, these predatory journals are problems too because people want to get their science out there and they don't care how it, even if it's through shady sources. All right, anyway, I'm I'm just, I, my brain is so frustrated right now. Mia, what do you think about this? Well, I think it's a crap in, crap out type of thing. So if you have a lot of, um, people just trying to crank out um, research and just get published because a lot of the you know professors have to do this. There's a lot of requirements on particular jobs that have to um, you have to hit a particular number of uh, publications in a year. Then people get into this habit of just you know like quick turn of the crank and putting whatever is out there, and then they get an option to get in these journals that look professional, look peer reviewed, and they just end up publishing whatever it is. Uh, that is the initial that's the initial part of a bigger problem. You know, you have people citing this research and then it's just snowballs into a much bigger problem. It does. And I mean, well, I I want to go back to my point. Like I'm reviewing articles right now. I won't say for which conference and I won't say what the topic is, but I'm researching these articles and there's not even a control in one of them. I, I just don't understand how. You know, where a control could very easily have been in this study. I just don't understand how we're not doing a great job with training the next generation of researchers. It it pisses me off. And it's not really contributing to science, really, because they're misinforming. They're, um, you know, they if they're wrong, they're probably being used for validating the wrong type of thing. You know, if somebody's really trying to prove their point and their point is not really... Um, provable, but then there's some journal out there that has some phony research showing that it is, then you're really perpetuating an, a, a misinformed viewpoint. Right, right, for sure. Blake, what do you think? What are your takes on this? Man, this this one really bummed me out because, I mean, it's important to me as a practicing scientist, right, that there's integrity in the research. But I'll, I'll tell you the truth. The part that bothered me the most is the idea of what it, I think what it calls like an open access public journal where you're basically having having the author pay to publish it, but it's open to everybody. I thought it was a great idea because, I mean, the more people that don't have to pay subscription fees or maybe you don't have the money – or it's just trying to get the word out there through these open source journals. I thought the idea itself was awesome, but it sucks that they seem to actually be, according to this article anyway, the predatory type journals that are just like taking a scientist's money, not really vetting the science or vetting anything that's in there. Um, I don't know. That yeah. that was the part that really bothered me because I like the fact that it's the idea is trying to get more of the research out there and into everybody's hands, even if you're not necessarily an academic art can't even understand some of the stuff and just want to learn more. Right. Uh, but it sucks that a lot of them are kind of targeting people. For sure. They're turning science into a business. All right. I'm, I'm too heated on this, Blake. We got to move on to the next one, man. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's, let's get a little chill here. So if you're trying to build a movie library without having to repurchase all the DVDs and Blu-rays you've already purchased, Walmart has a solution for you. So Walmart's streaming service, Vudu, that's an interesting name, <laughs> has, has you covered with a new feature via its iPhone and Android mobile apps. The new disc to digital feature allows users to scan the barcode 
on the case for their DVD or Blu-ray movies. You pay a $2 fee per movie for the transfer and optionally upgrade DVD titles to HD for $5 per title. Now, this would save me a whole lot, but I wonder about how they're going to charge you for the space, like holding these things in the cloud. What do you guys think? So, well, so the thing with this is uh, Voodoo is like any other a streaming service. Like, so take your Netflix, take your Hulu. The, it just grants you access to viewing this, right? So so think about it from that paradigm. But, um, it, yeah, there's there's a lot of things with this, but Mia, before I taint the waters here i want to get your i want to get your opinion on this um well i was never a movie collector per se i never i never had movies on dvd or anything like that but i did have i do have a lot of music that i wish i had available to me more often now um you know my old cds from high school sometimes i just really want to reminisce and i i feel like you know if we parlay that into dvds i'm sure a lot of people have a lot of dvds and movies that may not be available to them on netflix or any of the streaming services and they miss them they want to kind of go back to their old shows or things like that and this would be a great way for them to have easy access to them and um in the article it said that for five dollars you can get an hd version so you're not only updating but you're really updating your right current library now, now i think oh now funny really quick side story uh yeah no i know you don't watch movies because i had to take you to go see rogue one <laughs> listen i am getting better at this okay we still need to get the second movie in <laughs> yes so so far mia has seen rogue one and star wars episode four new hope and and listeners of the show know i'm like an avid star wars fan and it's just just funny to me that uh i'm i'm split i'm spreading the plague all right but um so back to this this uh, $2 thing. So I tried this out. I actually tried this thing, and it, and it opened up a couple of um, interesting things. So one, first off, I couldn't get any of my things to work, and it's a licensing issue. They're just they're doing it with sp- specific titles that you know obviously didn't sell well or whatever. They're not doing it with Star Wars, so I can't get my digital copies for $5. They're not doing it with Lord of the Rings or Back to the Future or any of the classics, right? But... I bet you if I were to scan some throwaway DVD, it would work. Um, now, this is this is really cool. I like this, but this opens up to this whole thing about like exploiting it, right? And I'm never suggesting that Human Factors Cast listeners or Human Factors Cast hosts would do this, but let's say <laughs> let's say hypothetically you went to the store. The, the way this works is you scan the UPC, right? And in order to get around that whole exploitation thing, they geotag your home and say, okay, if you're not within like, you know, five meters of your home, then you are, you're not going to get this thing. Uh, so what you do, if you are a, uh, hypothetically, if you're savvy, you'll go to the nearest Walmart, you'll go to the nearest Best Buy, whatever. Um, you'll purchase it, take it home, scan the UPC, and then take it right back. And you have, uh, the idea here is that if you already have it in HD quality, then it's only two dollars. So you buy the Blu-ray, scan it, pay two bucks, and you have it digitally. And so you got away with the actual version for two bucks and a trip to the store that you probably would have so, made anyway. Devil's advocate here. Um, I haven't bought you know DVDs in a while, but I think I got the Game of Thrones season. Um, as my last purchase, I think you're not allowed to return it if it's open. If it's open, I don't yeah. Know, really? Yeah, if it's open, I, but all you have to do is scan the UPC. They need those to check you out. Then bring it oh, back. No, that's so interesting. It's, yeah. It's, what's a UPC? The the little uh, barcode on the back. Oh, interesting. That's so all you they don't need. Even... Yeah. Okay. So this is almost like piracy, but at least they're making something off of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess, but it sounds like you can throw them for a loop pretty easy. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm not saying I did this. Like I said, I couldn't get the thing to work, so I couldn't have done it. Um, but, uh, but yeah. All right, what's up next, Blake? All right. So someone claiming to be a group of hackers called themselves the Turkish crime fam- family has apparently been trying to extort money from Apple. The group claims that login details for hundreds of millions of Apple accounts Apple accounts has been threatening to remotely wipe devices via iCloud unless it's paid $75,000 in Bitcoin or $100,000 in iTunes gift cards. Apple says that systems have not been breached and the alleged list appears to have been obtained from other sources. It also says it's 
actively monitoring to prevent unauthorized access and is working with law enforcement. It seems like a good time for anyone who has or ha- or used to have an Apple or iCloud account to update and lock down their security settings. Now, a little bit before the show, Mia, you talked a little bit about ransomware. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, one of the things that came up, um, you know, as I was reading through this, it's something that I read uh, maybe in January about a luxury hotel in Austria that got hacked and, you know, they were a victim of ransomware. So what the people who were trying to extort them were doing, they locked all the rooms of the hotel and they said, give me X amount of money and then I will release, you know, all the I will release this back to you guys. So it's it's not quite what we're dealing with here, but it's a similar situation where you're getting some money out of a hacking attempt without really destroying anything. Yeah, I I'm I'm I was cracking up over here because I'm like, okay, seventy five thousand dollars in Bitcoin, I get a hundred thousand dollars in iTunes gift cards. What are you, what are you gonna do? <laughs> what, that's what a, are they buying? That's a lot of Taylor Swift. Like I don't know, like. What do you? Yeah, exactly. How are you gonna convert that? I guess you could go to the mall kiosk and be like, "Yes, I have a hundred thousand dollars with the iTunes gift cards. Could you give me seventy five thousand dollars in credit?" I don't know. It's a little ridiculous to me, but it also highlights the um, the sort of real uh, threat that cybersecurity is, or, or that that cyber terrorism rather is is posing to us. And you know, this this whole issue of cybersecurity is really important and. Uh, yeah, I have no expertise on that topic, and I know it's it's pretty big. It was mentioned pretty heavily at the most recent Human Factors and Ergonomics Society meeting. Um, they they seem to want to put a, a, a stronger effort. Eff- 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 wow, can't talk. Emphasis on it. So I don't I don't know. I've I feel like we're getting closer. So at the beginning of the year, Mia, we we gave these predictions uh, about what we think might happen in 2017, and. Um, one of them, I predicted that, you know, there would be this massive cyber attack that really opened our eyes. Um, and I didn't want to equate it to 9-11, but I, I feel like there's, it's right on the horizon. I feel like we are just not prepared for a cyber attack of massive scale. And this kind of thing, especially extorting something that is so easily accessible by probably half of the um, developed nations worlds, like, it's just astounding to me. Blake, what are yeah. you what are you thinking on this, Blake? So, <laughs> I don't know why I can't get away from this, but I'm just going to go through one of the lines again. So, they've apparently got login details for hundreds of millions of Apple accounts, right? right. But they're asking for somewhere between 75 and 100k. And now in, in from my head, you could probably ask Apple a lot more for a lot more money if they really had something. Um, and again, I had the problem with the iTunes gift cards. I mean, what at best you're going to try and scalp a hundred thousand dollars worth of iTunes gift cards, gather people to get money from them. I don't really see the point. <laughs> and then they see uh, these hundred thousand dollars worth of purchases from one account. <laughs> I, well, yeah, there's that, there's that too, but I would assume that you're not that no, ridiculous to get caught know. like that. But the one part that I, I guess I haven't really looked into cause I'm new to having an iPhone and I haven't used it a lot is I is like, what really is going to happen to device? is if iCloud gets wiped um, for, for that many users. Apparently, a lot of people use it to back up their photos, contacts, all that kind of stuff. And maybe I'm just one particular guy, but I don't know. If you wipe my iCloud right now, I'd be fine. So I right. don't know. It, it seemed like a weird, just a weird scam to me. Right. Yeah, no, it probably is. But it still does open our eyes to that cybersecurity uh, threat. Now it's time to switch to Android, everybody. Uh, okay, Blake, what's up next? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm going back. All right. So bringing you your weekly wearable, here we go. Oh, this one's So fun. with people more, <laughs> people more likely to be locking eyes with their smartphone screens these days when hanging out around in public, a London-based design set of designers behind this feathery wearable are worried that the chances for exchanging flirtatious glances with passing strangers is being engineered out of daily life. Their answer to smartphones stealing your, your presence and peripheral vision is a sensory device called Ripple. The prototype device informs its wearer that they are being watched by sending a Ripple-like sensation up their back. At this point, the wearer can turn their body to determine who in the room is peeping at them. When the device detects they are looking at the person who is looking at them, they'll receive a 
tap on the chest to confirm that. And if they keep looking, Ripple will keep rippling. Now, guys... I don't know if you did, but I took a look at the prototype version of this and I watched the video and I feel like everybody in the room would be looking at you if you were wearing one of these. It looks... Yeah. Do you want to describe him to them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me, it looks like you have basically... I don't, it, they say see an enemy in the... Uh, uh, what do you call it? In the article itself. But it looks like something that you would see Chris Tucker wearing in The Fifth Element. Like, it's just like tentacles coming off your shoulders oh, with yeah. beads at the top. Oh, yeah. It's... Imagine- uh, um, spiky but soft spiky um, shoulder pads that are attached to a light harness that goes over your shoulder. Honestly, it looks like something out of a video game. Like this is this is the piece from the Final Dungeon, man. Like you you get this thing and you equip it, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, cool shoulders, man." Um, <laughs> this like I don't under okay. So hang on, help me break this down, guys. So so first off, they send a ripple like sensation up their back. And this thing looks like it's on their shoulders. Like, is it just like, is it just, are the shoulders just peacocking to let other people know that you have a ripple device? <laughs> like, I don't. I don't know. From what I'm gathering here is that all the little spikes have some kind of device at the very end that kind of sees if somebody's looking at you. And then the harness that goes all the way from the front of your shoulder to the back of your um, shoulder maybe has some kind of haptic sen- sensor that, um, which is what ripples, but I don't know. I don't know why they wouldn't just have your shoulder ripple instead of your back. I have no idea. It's supposed to be uh, like Anakin and Padme in uh, Episode Two, and he's like, you know, caressing her uh, arm and says, "I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and gets everywhere." You haven't got don't there yet. It. We, I know, spoilers, right? We got to get you there. But uh, spoiler. <laughs> the I, I guess the idea is that it's supposed to be like kind of, I don't know intimate but like a mat okay imagine you are sitting down in a subway and uh, a homeless guy somehow got a ripple and he's looking at you and (laughs) you feel this tingle (laughs) up your back and you look at him and it taps and then you're like oh god like (laughs) like a little more intrusive than they were expecting yeah i mean how is it gonna how how are you gonna prevent uh harassment from people like i guess so I guess if you if you keep looking at the person, it keeps rippling, right? But then what's the timeout period? Like, what if you accidentally look away and then you look back? Does it ripple again? Like, I don't... It wasn't all clear to me. And what if you have a stalker and all they do is look at you directly and they don't look away? Are you going to be rippling for 30 minutes? The Spidey Spitz is tingling, <laughs> like, all the time. <laughs> a constant ripple. Oh, man. Oh, man. This was a, this was a good one-liner at the beginning. I feel like we could make an episode title out of this, but I'm not. I am not quite sh- there yet. Yeah, and just I I don't know if we're gonna move on from this, but um, the my last comment would be that there's there's a timeout on your skin about how long you can actually feel this sensation, you know, vibration, uh, tactile cueing. Right. Your skin gets used to it, so I don't know if this was kind of a art project, and, and you know, they weren't really obviously thinking that people were gonna really look and wear this out. Um, but it's an uh, interesting idea, definitely, for how to unglue people from their screens and how to make them interact with the world after everybody gets used to looking at their screens. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but yeah, those those shoulder pieces will do it. All right, Blake, what's up next? All right, so moving away from the tiered shoulder pieces. All right, so when a young boy identified Roman, identified only as Roman, couldn't wake up his unconscious mother, he did what any astute technology technologically adept four-year-old would do he used his mother's finger to unlock her phone and then asked siri to call emergency services the boy's action saved his mother's life but the incident exposed some dark and dangerous flaws in our increasingly landlineless world that sounds awfully morbid so what do you guys think about this i mean i think nick do you have a clip for this one i do i do but i want to i want to get your thoughts on it first um, but really quick, really quick, I just thought of an excellent episode title, uh, Epic Shoulder Pieces of Flirting Plus One. <laughs> <laughs> there that's, we go. That's like it. it. All right, cool. Right, just sell it for everybody. Oh, man. All right, so yeah, this uh, so this, this is a cool story. Uh, I do have the audio. I'm waiting on it, though. Let me, let me hear what you guys think. Mia, what did you think of this story? Um, so there's 
there have actually been some movies. I don't know if you saw the horrible San Andreas uh, movie about uh, this California earthquake. One of the issues that they ran into was that when they were trying to get in touch with people, there were no landlines, so they couldn't um, they couldn't contact anybody. All the towers, the cell phone towers were down. Um, so this kind of touches on this particular issue. The kid didn't have any other way of getting in touch with emergency services, and he was really clever and used his mom's finger to access her phone and get a hold of somebody that could help. Um, but that may not be the case in every situation. It's obviously something amazing that happened here. And, you know, the mom turned out to be okay. And the kid was super brilliant in using what they had at their fingertips. But um, it's it's definitely a, an interesting conundrum that people are going to find themselves in an emergency situation when cell phones don't work. Right. Like, what do you do? Right. Yeah. The article saves that uh, says that the uh, the ability to lock people out of your phone can also be, you know, it, it's a it's a um, a gift, but it can also be a burden. Right. Like you, you keep other people out of your phone, but you also keep potentially someone saving your life out of your phone, too. This kid is incredibly resourceful. Um, and he's just a freaking hero, man. Like <laughs> this kid's my hero. He's awesome. Blake, do you have any thoughts on this before I play the audio? I mean, it, I think like you both are saying, in this case, they were like everybody in the house was super lucky that the mom just happened to use the fingerprint for her phone to unlock. Because I mean, I don't like the fingerprint stuff, so I use like actual pin codes and things like that. And maybe a kid wouldn't know that. How would they have gotten into this? And I, and I had not realized like how inaccurate even pinging your closest cell phone tower from your cell phone when like a paramedic is coming is. So. I don't know. Maybe there is a case to have a landline these days. Who knows? Right. Yeah. No, I saw an article that the first thing you say when you get on the with the emergency services is where you're located. Um, that's like uh, human factors cast tip. Just tell them where you're at when you need to call emergency services. All right. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and play this clip. Just amazing. Hang on. Oh, hang on. It's uh, it's having trouble here. Hang on. Let's see if we can. Okay, where's your mummy? She's at home. And where are you? At home as well. Can you do me a favour? Can you go and get mummy? She can't, she's dead. You said mummy was there. What do you mean she's dead? It means that she's closing her eyes and she's not breathing. Right, so do you know where you live? Road 22. Can you go to your mummy and shake her for me? She's she's not waking up. Give her a good shake. Shout out, mummy. Mummy! It didn't work. Are you in Kenley? Yes, Kenley. What's your name? Roman. Man, that kid, that kid deserves a medal. Like, he was so calm, cool, and collected. I couldn't believe it. Well, but like Blake said, I think it was a fa- like multiple factors that worked in their favor. The fact that the kid actually knew his address, the fact that he was able to access a phone because it had a fingerprint on, um, fingerprint reader, and the mom at some point had done it in front of him, or he was aware of it some other way. That that's the way to get um, into the phone. The fact that he knew how to call the emergency service number. A lot of things could have gone wrong, but luckily they all worked out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Blake, what's up next? All right, so moving on a little bit. So scientists at the University of Gaslo have invented a robot skin that surpasses human flesh. So Professor Ravindir Deha and his team created a silicone and graphene skin which provides haptic feedback to the user. The thin layer of graphene acts as a sensor making electronic skin or e-skin very sensitive to touch. It also is flexible and cheap to manufacture. It's solar powered and the hand operates from a, oh, here we go, photovoltaic cell and is fully autonomous. A a solar panel that catches light rests just underneath the transparent e skin. Now, Nick and Mia, you two jump in for this one because I got a little confused because it talks about the application of it in prosthesis later in the future, but this is for robots, correct? Uh, for now, I'm yeah. The reason this is in Human Factors news is because, can you imagine what it could do in the future? Oh yeah, it it's got to be really insane. I mean, it's it's crazy that this is all solar powered. It's 
able to understand haptic feedback at such a level that they think it could, uh, like a robot could adjust its grip based on how it's interacting with something. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I'm, when I was seeing okay. this, um, it, again, I don't know why I have so many references to movies that I've seen lately, but uh, one of my coworkers actually commented about um, a movie called Ex Machina. And that's the first thing that I thought about when I read about the e skin, because one of the things that they mentioned in the movie is how this particular um, robot woman looks and senses like a human because her skin is so powerfully developed. You know, it, it is very sensitive to the touch and um, it can understand pressure and things like that. So that's it's amazing. And I can't believe that this is coming because it's going to be great for prosthesis, like they mentioned. I'm what I'm really curious is about is uh, how this how this skin handles two point discrimination, right? And uh, oh. that's 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 on skin too. What's that? Um, that's something that humans can't do very well. So exactly, I, it's super skin. Then you know maybe they yeah. fix that issue. Yeah, can you imagine like if we had super skin on our back and we'd be able to tell with the same resolution that we can distinguish on our tongue, you know, <laughs> like because uh, for our listeners that are not familiar with so two two point discrimination or two dot discriminations, it's basically how far apart two points need to be in order for you as the human to distinguish that they are indeed separate points. Right. So if you if you were to put a, a, a caliper on your back or something, you that's like where you're your weakest ability to discriminate is right. So you could have these things pretty far apart and you'd still distinguish them as only one point. So if you, if you had this skin and uh, this robot arm, maybe, or, or this robot skin, I guess just the skin, uh, it, you know, you might be able to be superhuman in that regard, which we'll talk about superhumans a little bit later with Elon Musk, but uh, Blake, what are you, what are you thinking about this one? I I I don't know. Almost <laughs> rereading like some just the uh, the blurb itself. It seems like it's unreal because this thing is, apparently it's like it's flexible. You can easily manufacture it. It's solar powered. I mean, there's applications in both robots and in human prosthetics. And you guys are talking about basically super skin. So I don't know. This is super awesome. I would love to see how this kind of uh, stuff with prosthesis will interact with eventually, and we'll talk about this a little bit with Elon Musk, like you said, but just brain interfaces um, oh, for man. giving you that much more uh, shooting signals to the prosthetic and things like that. Would be amazing. I hate to keep bringing up Star Wars, but oh, and I'm not going <laughs> to spoil it either, but uh, it's here. Just saying. Fans of the series will know. All right, Blake, what's up <laughs> next? <laughs> oh, man. All right. So, Getting back to good science versus our first story, a recently published paper in the Journal of Planning, Education, and Research explored how interactions between humans and self-driving cars could change the rules of the road. (laughs) Author Adam Miller Ball first explained that pedestrians currently use a mental calculation when deciding to cross the street. Drivers also have a decision to make whether to yield or not to yield. The setup is a crosswalk game of chicken between driver and pedestrian. That's a scary game. While intuitively it may seem that seem that pedestrians are more likely to be hurt by a collision, would always yield first would always yield first, their actions are in fact shaped by social norms. Drivers are likely likely to yield when hampered by busy traffic or, for example, unpredictable tourists. But if the local norm is always for pedestrians to wait, the risk of crossing is greater and waiting for waiting then makes even more sense. This problem highlights the human component of integrating autonomous vehicles into our everyday lives. So, Mia, what did you think about this article? Well, I have a, actually a funny story. I have a friend that um, lives in the UK and he works for a car manufacturer and he gets to, he has a really cool job and he gets to kind of test things um, as they come in the um, in the factory. And one of the things that he was <laughs> kind of having fun with was this car um, detection, like automatic braking, if it detected something. And he volunteered to be the person that would, you know, stand there while the car was, you know, going to accelerate towards him and then... Oh, geez. It, him and break. Well, I mean, he said it was going to be okay because it was going to be going slow. Well, it turned out that whoever was driving was driving under uh, 10 mile an hour and um, they weren't aware that that was this threshold for it to kick in. So he actually, I mean, the guy ended up having to obviously um, break to not run my friend over. But I'm just intrigued about how this sensing 
um, the car sensing uh, pedestrian is going to work out if it's not somebody that can actually slam on the brake and make sure that it actually is working. Uh, the other part that I am interested in is this negotiation that happens. You know, when um, they were, you guys were reading about the blurb, there's uh, kind of an un spoken rule in some places where pedestrians kind of have the right of way and some other places like where I'm from, I'm from South America, pedestrians never have the right of way. You know, it's the car and then you're the one that has to dodge the car. So um, having a universal thing may be, may be a little bit difficult to implement because of all the different um, custom constraints and cultural constraints. Yeah. And the, those constraints are real, man. Like, okay. So when I was in Idaho, okay. So from Southern California originally, it's it's kind of half and half here. It's like people first in some situations, but like if you're in a city, forget about it. It's cars first always. Um, and like moving to Idaho was such – this social norm is real because what I would do is um, – typically from like a city here where like you're you're walking along and you're like oh I'll just let the car go I'll walk behind them right and they don't understand that and so it was always frustrating to me because I would go to walk behind them. I'd walk literally towards the car because they wouldn't be there two seconds later and then they would stop for me and I would like almost run into the car and then I would have to correct course correct and then go straight across the pathway it's really interesting problem that this um this article is highlighting and uh, it, it's really, it's, it's going to change because as humans are like, oh yeah, self-driving cars will do this. And so we'll make, we'll develop that heuristic in our minds and we'll go, oh, it will break for me if I walk. And so then you're just going to have a bunch of people just walking across, like not caring about all these autonomous vehicles that could potentially kill them if the safe uh, guards don't kick in. What about you, One thing. But one thing I, I think about this is I immediately jumped in my head and was like, well, okay, if it's a social norm, depending on how autonomous vehicles like start to take, if they can take in data and learn from the situations they've been in, kind of just like adding deep learning to the tip, to a typical algorithm, it might be able to take into account what's going to happen in social norms. Like if you, if you live in a particular place, like you mentioned, Mia, being in in South America where people are dodging cars, maybe it can account for that over time. But I think the real problem starts to come together when now autonomous vehicles are interacting with each other. So they're having to learn behavior of people plus potentially of what, how other autonomous autonomous vehicles are going to react based off of the extreme variable of pedestrians. Um, but I don't know. I think this is a cool article just because it's showing that we're moving so like over the past few weeks we've had a lot of these from like the dot and all that kind of stuff so it's cool to watch the progression of how people are thinking ahead of self-driving cars being like a normal everyday thing right I this agree. was actually Go ahead, a really Mia. long talk um at hfes with don norman about this negotiation that happens with autonomous vehicles and where we're going and how soon, you know, people think, you know, people in the industry think that they're actually going to be um, amongst us. And um, Don Norman seemed to say that he sees it happening quicker than, you know, we realize within the next five or 10 years, but it's going to be a limited type use, you know, maybe some only highway. And then once you get off the highway, then uh, somebody has to take over the control. So I don't think this pedestrian uh, autonomous vehicle negotiation is going to be um, a very, you know, quick adaptation to our normal everyday life. It might take a lot longer than actually having autonomous vehicles and highways. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. Things could change over time as we get used to autonomous vehicles. All right, Blake. Uh, wait, really quick though, there are this this article is really interesting. There's a lot that we didn't talk about. They kind of break down three different scenarios about how humans can interact with this stuff. But it's definitely worth it for our listeners to go check it out and. So, you know, we are more active on our Facebook pages and Twitter, so you can go check out all the articles that we're talking about throughout the week uh, on, on those social media platforms. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. All right. So a little bit about augmented reality here. So Amazon's retail plans could extend well beyond books and groceries. The New York Times sources hear that the Internet ga- Internet giant is exploring the possibility of appliance and furniture stores with a technological angle. You'd use augmented or virtual reality to see how items would look in your home, making it easier to pull the trigger on that new couch or stove. 
Now, th this is really interesting to me because Amazon kind of ran the platform for we're pretty much going to run <laughs> run brick and mortar stores out of business. And now they're going backwards. They're going into our home. <laughs> yeah, letting you see their products in your home. And now they're opening shops like they they do have bookshops and all that kind of stuff now. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I I think that. Uh, can OK, imagine this scenario. You are in your house. You're in your house. And uh, you're you're looking at the wall, and you pull out your phone. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that poster that I saw on Amazon.com looked like, uh, would look like, hanging up right there in a nice frame. And you pull out your little augmented reality Amazon app, and you put it up on the wall, and you're like, wow, it looks like a teenager's bedroom. This looks awesome. I want it. Buy it now. And boom, it shows up on your doorstep two days later. Or shoot, we need a new couch because this futon I've had since college is busted, and we can't even like sit down on it without it being uncomfortable what would a new couch look like oh you mean that'll be here in two days buy it now they're just making it so easy and and uh amazon has this advantage of having this wide catalog of stuff it's just uh you know we saw this with pottery barn and lowe's and the ar stuff is is definitely coming around mia what do you think about this well, I was actually a little confused because when I was reading this, um, so now that you guys are mentioning it, it kind of makes more sense. But when I was reading this, it seemed like it would be an actual furniture store or an actual electronic store. And then it would have this component where you could kind of place it in your home. But I wasn't really making the leap between I'm at the store and then this is what my space looks like at home uh, in a virtual environment. So. Um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to accomplish this. I'm, I'm not really, I'm a little confused about it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, after hearing Nick talk about it, I am too, because what Nick described is what I would want to do. I'd want to see like the appliance or whatever in my home, kind of like a callback to last week with Pottery Barn, letting you see what furniture would look like in your house. But in this scenario, it looks like they're describing actually having a brick and mortar store that you would be like exploring the catalog through. I don't know. I'm I'm confused as well now. I well, okay. So let me let me see if I can clear this up a little bit. So when I said you know you can you can pull it up, the idea here is that you can go shop in this brick and mortar store like uh, like anything else. But they're not banking on you leaving with anything. I would imagine that they're banking on you taking home a SKU, one of those barcodes that we talked about earlier, and scanning it once you're in your house, and then boom. You have it there. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Prime member. I'm just going to press this button, and it'll show up on my doorstep two days later. Like, that's that's kind of the revolution. Like, I almost feel like it's the Apple Store. You go in to look. You don't go in to buy, really. Like, I guess people go in to buy stuff at Apple. So I don't know how Apple works. But it, it's almost like you're selling the product, and, um, you know, your focus is on the product and less about the let's make the sale. Like, take it home, think about it, see how it looks in your place. That's uh, That's – kind of how I'm interpreting this. And again, these are just based on reports from the New York Times. So, you know, who knows? Who knows? It could be what I'm saying. It could be book, brick and mortar stores that you like literally bring in a floor plan of your house and it's virtually augmented there. I, do, I feel like that'd be less effective, but... Well, it's kind of where I, my, my brain was going. When you were describing this, I'm like, you know what would be really cool? If I pull up this thing on my phone and I say, ooh, I want to see what this... Um, new sofa looks like I click on and then somehow my phone turns it into this like image that is projected from my phone and the the ratio is respected and then I can see it and I can locate it and make sure that it fits and that type of thing um, but I don't know if this is what they're trying to do here is I'm still trying to figure it out because I know that for example Ikea online has something similar where it knows the specific um details of whatever you're trying to shop for you know if you're looking for a kitchen you can tell it that your room is at 20 by 20 and then you can like place the individual things that you have in your shopping bag around and you can see how much it would be for countertops and how much um all of the um all of the um I um, can't think of the word. All of the things that you're trying to shop for, the electronic stuff, how they relate to each other, what kind of sizes they have, and things like that. But that already exists, so I'm not sure that's what they're trying to do with Amazon. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Any closing thoughts, Blake? No, I, just, I think the... I definitely think that there's some good meshing, but I, 
I think the business model you're talking about, Nick, where it's basically people are looking at stuff and then they go home and they would buy it. That's probably what they're more projecting, right? Um, cool idea. Amazon is always pushing the bounds, it seems. It seems like they're in our news circuit every week. All right, what's up next? Because we have Alexa on the show, but I don't know. Oh, yeah. All hang right. on, hang on. Speaking of which, <laughs> Alexa, how are you doing? Great. Ready to help. <laughs> oh, good. Oh. <laughs> What was that, Mia? Sorry. Ask Ask Alexa what she thinks about Amazon. Uh, yeah, she's going to be really biased. Uh, Alexa, what do you think <laughs> about Amazon? Sorry, I didn't understand the question I heard. I was not expecting that. All right, Blake, what's up next? <laughs> All right. So despite law enforcement's attempt to conceal its existence, it's no secret that half the Americans over the age of 18, that's about 117 million people in total, are part of a massive fa- facial recognition database. Their what? personal that's information is pulled from DMV files from 18 states. <laughs> a staggering 80% of people in the database don't have any sort of arrest record. Yet the system's facial recognition algorithm inaccurately identifies them during criminal searches 15% of the time with black women most often being misidentified the house of committee on oversight and government reform heard last week so i I can't remember the the article very clearly but i thought we just talked about law enforcement having this facial recognition software like as as if it was a new release from i think taser and they specifically said that this was not being done so i'm very concerned about some of this stuff yeah yeah they're they're very flip-floppy on what exists and then what doesn't and then yeah i I mean uh yeah i (laughs) I guess the only saving grace was that in the article it says that this facial recognition software is so inaccurate, amongst other things. But it, yes. it, it, I think it's kind of nuts that that much data is out there and we didn't know it until recently. I think the inaccuracy is part of the problem, though. Because, I mean, okay, think about this. When you are a, a team of white males putting together a, uh, a program to facially identify different features in people white males are going to be able to distinguish features from other white males and as unfortunate as it is you have that in-group bias where you'll you're not able to distinguish between people of other races ethnicities um cultural backgrounds and it just goes to show that we need to take more like this is the thing this is the thing that i took away this 15 percent of the time that black women are most often being misidentified that is a huge statistic to me and it's really upsetting because there needs to be more care in like, especially in this type of software where you are defining somebody based on the way they look. You know, you need to put together a group that fully understands like all, it needs to be multicultural and it needs to be just a, a, a variety of a melting pot. I just, I can't, <laughs> it's so upsetting yeah, it's one of those where I would wonder, like, who developed the software and what were the constraints. But but anyway, Mia, what do you think about this one? Well, I think part of the issue is that they took this from a DNB database. So all the pictures are front-facing, uh, probably poor lighting, you know. Because I'm thinking Facebook does a really good job at identifying faces, which at some point actually gets a little creepy because you're trying to upload pictures and all of a sudden it identifies everybody on your picture before you even get to it, before you even tell it, a, you know, a small list of people to choose from so their facial recognition technology has improved quite a bit in the past few years so i'm surprised that this tool hasn't you know has such a high failure rate and i think part of it is because it doesn't have access to pictures that come from different angles and it can you know adjust the angles based on the type of information that it's getting that's a really good point yeah i I agree that facebook's facial recognition feature is scary maybe they should get mark zuckerberg over there at uh in the fbi to uh (laughs) <laughs> help with those facial recognition algorithms. All right. I, I've any closing thoughts, Blake, I'm ready to move on to the next one. Uh, I'm stoked to talk about the next one. So let's get going. Let's do it. All right. All right. So somewhere between rolling out new Tesla's launching resu- reusable rockets and digging a tunnel under LA, Elon Musk managed to start yet another startup company. Uh, according to the wall street journal, a wall street journal report, Musk's latest project called Neuralink and is called Neuralink, and its goals are to explore technology that can make direct connections between brain 
a brain, a human brain and a computer. The California based neuroscience startup aims to create cranial computers for te- for treating diseases and eventually for building human computer hybrids is reg- and is registered as a medical research company and reportedly already has hired several high profile academics in the field of neuroscience like Tesla or SpaceX the company plans to pr- present a working prototype to prove the technology is safe and viable before moving on to the more ambitious goal of increasing the performance of the human race Oh my I was so excited to read this article, but I really want to hear what you guys' take on it was. Mia, uh, you Mia, go, what do you got? Yeah, you go up first, Mia. <laughs> first of all, I love this guy. I think he's so forward thinking and he doesn't let anything bound his his mind. It's just unbelievable. And I'm kind of glad that I get to see this happen, you know, in my in my lifetime. The one thing I'm really excited about is obviously the application about um, of this technology and prosthetics and being able to connect um, your brain and your intention with um, this, you know, prosthetic that is connected to you. I think it's amazing. There have been many improvements in the the type of um, interaction that you have with that prosthetic, but I think this will kind of close the gap and make it as real as possible to to somebody that is using a prosthetic. Um, the one that I'm actually very interesting about uh, interested about is where you're going to be able to somehow control your emotions based on this you know if you have your brain connected with um a computer and you you're able to dial back if you're feeling like you're angry or something i i want to i want to see where this goes where it goes to um emotion control and emotion feedback type thing oh my gosh i to me what this this is almost like elon musk is very afraid of the singularity and he said so before but i almost feel like by hooking humans up to machines to computers that maybe this is starting it maybe then we will become the computers that are the singularity like i feel like (laughs) this is uh this is really uh, i i'm intrigued by this don't get me wrong i'm very intrigued but this is very scary because what happens when you offload thoughts into the cloud like, how does that even, how, how does the processing power even happen? So you, you think of a thought, you upload it to the cloud. Do you have to sign an end-user license agreement that says that thought is no longer yours? Is it now Elon Musk's? Is it Tesla's? Is it, is it uh, Neuralink's? Like, I don't know. There's all these ethical questions with this too, right? And I just, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around all of the in- intricacies of this. And I just, there's so much there. <laughs> my mind is blown. Maybe I need Neuralink to help me manage this workload. I don't know. Blake, what are you thinking? You're really excited over this. Yeah. So this this is really cool from the medical perspective, right? Because like, what if you can use some of these, uh, what do they call them? Brain human interfaces of BHIs to combat things like Alzheimer's, right? To either shock your brain or help your brain recoup from things that it's lost or like you're talking about kind of offload it into different places whether it's the cloud or some kind of hybrid machine that lives on the side of your brain to let you store memory but the the thing that i thought was interesting in the article was that because i i was really in tune when he was kind of freaking about freaking out about the the dawn of ai and the singularity and it's it seems really strange that now he's launching a company that's basically gonna kind of help that along but one line in the article itself talks a lot about about the reason behind this, at least from his perspective, was to help people keep up with machines, to be able to keep learning at the same rate or at a higher rate to stay ahead of them. If this is truly going to be what we're going to see, we're going to see a, a world full of robots and autonomy and stuff like that. So I think it's a I think like like you're saying, there's some bit of danger here because like you're talking about, that's almost like a high mind tech. Oh, type yeah. of mentality like well, well well whose thoughts are they now or are they really your thoughts are they the hive's thoughts who who has control over them can you get in trouble for just having thoughts um just another quick thought too like how do you process media if you can download an episode of a show you don't have to experience it because it's there in your memory like now we're getting into um uh wow total recall territory i don't know any closing thoughts on this one mia well, I was just, you know, like leaving back to the first matrix where you're uploading skills and it's basically what you were saying. You know, you're downloading your consciousness, but you're also uploading experiences. And that's kind of, it's kind of breaching 
the point of life, you know, it's, it, and we can get all philosophical about it, but this is, um, yeah, very scary territory. We'll hopefully get some good things out of it, but um, leave the bad things at bay. Yes, yes, I totally agree. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that we forgot and didn't cover and you want us to cover, you can follow us on all our social media. We're being more active over there. So head on over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook page. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud. Reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. You can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're really uh, brave like that little kid who, uh, Roman, Roman, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. I'm just kidding. Roman didn't really call in. But, Roman, if you're listening, call in. You can also support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. I want to thank my panel for being on the show today. Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at DopePanicUX. And Mia, where can they find you? Oh. I don't know if we can handle all the signals. She's at LinkedIn at Manuela Jaramillo. And uh, you can check out the show notes for the spelling on that. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, remember, it depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. It depends.